From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. As Congress unveils a $1.7 trillion omnibus spending package, the question is, how many kitchen sinks did they throw in at the end? Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with the Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, columnist Kim Strassel and editorial board member Kate batchelder Odell. The bill was dropped early Tuesday morning. It is 4,155 pages, and Congress is now expected to pass it here in a matter of days. They haven't read it. The press is only beginning to digest what's in this piece of legislation. But let's start with what they're saying. And first, we have this morning Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and then Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. From start to finish, from top to bottom, This omnibus is bold, generous, far-reaching, and ambitious. It's not everything we would have wanted, of course. Lots of, when you're dealing in a bipartisan, bicameral way, you have to sit down and get it done, and that means each side has to concede some things. But it is something that we can be very proud of, all of us. Now, we must get this done before Friday, well, well before that, if possible. No, there's no question that an omnibus spending bill less than one week before Christmas is not the right way to run the appropriations process or the Senate chamber. Things should be done differently, more responsibly, with more foresight and more planning. And when Republicans control the majority, things were in fact done differently, more responsibly, with more foresight. Kim, almost 4,200 pages here. It it calls to my mind the phrase thrown under the omnibus, which was the title of a P.J. O'Rourke book. Before we dig into a handful of the specifics, what do we know so far about the top line? Well, first of all, can I just comment on both of the leaders there? They're both wrong. This is probably one of the ugliest pieces of legislation I have ever seen in my life. And I've been doing this for a very long time because essentially this is an omnibus with all manner of legislation that they didn't get done this year tacked on the side. But in terms of the actual spending numbers, $1.66 trillion in terms of the underlying money. The big question going into this was what would be the split between defense dollars and non-defense dollars? Because for years, Democrats have have insisted on what they call parity. If there's going to be an increase in defense, they want an equal increase in non-defense money. And here's what's interesting and should give you your first hint that bad things have happened in this bill, is that both sides are claiming different numbers on the non-defense side. So to listen to Mitch McConnell's side, they're claiming that they got $858 billion for defense, which is a 9.7% increase over last year. And that there's $772 billion for non-defense spending, which would be about a 7.9% increase. According to them, that is a break in parity. But if you go over to Rosa DeLauro, the House Appropriators website, they're claiming that that number for non-defense is not 772, but is $800 billion, which would be 9.3% increase and essentially, therefore, about the same increase as defense. My betting is that Democrats are being more honest here. It sounds as though there was a bunch of gimmicky accounting, et cetera, that allowed them to claim some things were mandatory on a one-off, et cetera, so that they could hide a little bit of those dollars, at least Republicans could, and they could claim that they got a victory here. I wouldn't buy it. And then just also on top line money, in addition to those two categories, there's also $45 billion in here for Ukrainian aid and also also $38 billion in disaster relief. So this number gets way up above $1.7 trillion. There are some wins, though, in a bill that is 4,200 pages long. One that I would point to is the Electoral Count Act reform. This is the version that was attached to it that was advanced in the Senate by Senator Susan Collins. And the Electoral Count Act, recall, is the law that governs the counting of the Electoral College on January 6th. This is the law that President Trump tried to exploit some ambiguities in. And a few of the changes, I think, look pretty important. So there's a piece of federal law that says state legislatures can override the popular vote if their state failed to make a choice on Election Day and doesn't really define that. So that's a clear vulnerability. This reform would change that and it would allow states to move 
the presidential election day if there are extraordinary and catastrophic events. So you can imagine a court, for example, interpreting that after a hurricane or a terrorist attack or something like that. This legislation would raise the threshold for Congress to object to electoral votes. Right now, one member of the House and one member of the Senate need to object, and then the chambers have to break to debate that. This bill would change it to 20 percent of the House and 20 percent of the Senate. And so it would hopefully do away with some of these phony objections that have been lodged, not only after the 2020 election, but in several recent elections. And then it clarifies that the role of the vice president at the joint session of Congress is purely ceremonial. So those are all good changes. I'm not sure that this is the, the perfect reform of the Electoral Count Act. I think there were some high points of the House bill that I would have liked to see make it in here. But my main complaint with that is that it's been two years and this didn't need to come at the end in a massive omnibus bill. We ought to have had a real vote on this and we could see where everybody stood. Kate, Kim mentioned the $45 billion in Ukraine aid. Would you count that as a win? And how long does that keep the U.S. aid going here? Well, Kyle, yes, yeah, since there's so little good to say about this bill, it is important, I think, to focus on the couple good points. I think Ukraine assistance is among that. Before we get there, I am very intrigued by, as well as Kim on the top line, I think basically Republicans are trying to say that outside $22 billion for the VA, they held to 5.5% increases. So it's a little bit trying to say, you know, we prevented all the spending except for the stuff that, that we didn't prevent. And Kim laid out last week some efforts to try to make some of this VA spending into mandatory accounts so that it goes on autopilot and it frees up other money for discretionary spending. Senator Shelby in the Senate insists that this is all going into discretionary accounts, but that will be something to look very closely at to see what kind of games Congress is trying to play here. But anyway, on the Ukraine front, I think that is a, a positive development. I think all things considered, like your point about electoral reform, it probably would have been better to have a debate on its own instead of jamming everything into one bill that we now just call the bill Congress is passing. I think there could be some resistance to some of the Ukraine funding, but important to remember that a lot of this funding at this point is going to backfill U.S. weapon stocks from what we've already given Ukraine. It's really focusing on it, our own military preparedness as well as NATO's. The other thing we should talk about, Kyle, while we can say anything good about this bill, is that Congress will fund the Defense Department at the authorized levels. And it's you know more than an 8% increase from last year, which is about level with inflation. And there are some good priorities in that defense budget, getting the Navy shipbuilding schedule back on track, trying to build more ships, expanded production for munitions, some of which we could run really low on in a war. It is, I think, a pretty consequential defense bill. But again, this is the only time of year where we fund the nation's military, which is a core task of government. And for some reason, it gets held hostage here with all these just domestic priorities that we spend on the rest of the year as well. So again, that's pretty mild praise, but I do think that is a good portion of this bill. Another notable piece we've talked in recent days about TikTok, and there was a Senate bill that recently passed, advanced by Republican Senator Josh Hawley, to ban federal workers from having TikTok on any government-owned devices. That is reportedly now in this omnibus package, so that would pass if the omnibus budget bill passes. Kim, what about some of the things that are not in the bill? My understanding is there's no expansion of the child tax credit that Democrats wanted, no extension of the business depreciation rules that are starting to ratchet down here on January 1st, no marijuana banking. And what about this permitting package that has been promised to Joe Manchin and by Joe Manchin? Yeah, the real pity here is the one you mentioned about business expensing. As you pointed out, companies starting at the beginning of this year are going to be able to write off fewer important provisions and that will continue to ratchet down over time. And the thing is, is that that provision actually has bipartisan support. And it arguably should have been in this bill or it should have been passed on a standalone basis and with a great deal of support. The problem is that Democrats decided to attempt to pair it with the re-expansion of the child tax credit. And there was a real mismatch there in that the child tax credit would have cost a ton of money. It's also in not a bipartisan provision for the most part. And Republicans were like, hey, why should we be trading something you already want for something we don't? So that all got blown up and is not in the bill. Chuck Schumer did not get the provisions he wanted that would make it easier for banks to work with the marijuana industry. And then 
yes, notably, there is no mansion permitting. Remember, when Manchin agreed to go along with this final spending blowout just before the election, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, he was promised a vote on his permitting bill. I'm really surprised this is not in here, in part because you would think that when you had something this huge that was designed to grease the wheels for all kinds of things, that this would be the best place that you could get it through. I have to assume that it was because Republicans said no. And as Democrats are going to need some Republican votes to get this across the line, that was one of the casualties. (laughs) 